Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Zoo School Live. My name is Laura, and today we're going to get a little birdie. We're going to talk about the Great Backyard Bird Count. Now, you actually can participate in this at home, or if you want, you can come join us at the zoo. The Great Backyard Bird Count is a worldwide event, and it happens four days every February. This year, it's happening the 12th through the 15th. And what happens is people actually count the birds that they're seeing in their backyards or their nearby areas. And it's really just as simple as that. You just have to take about 15 minutes and count some birds. We're gonna get into how we can do that and how to attract them to, into your neighborhood today. And we're gonna take a peek at our bird feeders here at Elmwood Park Zoo and hopefully learn a little bit about identifying the types of birds you might see in your neighborhood. Now again, the bird count, it was developed in 1998 by Cornell and Audubon, which are two really big names in bird conservation and research. And it became worldwide in the early 2000s, and millions of people participate in this across the world. So if you're interested and you wanna join us, we're actually going to be holding bird count times on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of this year, of this weekend, from 9 to 10 a.m. and you can get a first-hand look at how we do this. But if you're at home and you're not able to make it to the zoo, we're going to talk about how you can get involved as well because this is a citizen science program and that is just a fancy way of saying that anybody, any citizen, can get involved and assist in science. So why would we want to count birds? Well, we can learn a lot about how their populations are doing by taking the information that everybody submits. So if you have birds in your backyard and you're sending that information into Cornell and Audubon, they can actually add that in with all the other data they collect from other people and that gives them an idea of how the populations are doing for different species, when different species are moving through the area because while it is so cold and snowy, we're soon going to be coming up on spring migration. So all of this information is really important for figuring out how birds are doing in the wild and how we can better help them. So, Today we're going to talk a little bit about the birds that you might see in your backyard. Now, if you're not an expert, that's totally okay. It's pretty easy to start observing birds. There's a couple different things you really want to look for. The biggest one is going to be their size and their shape. So if you have a bird that looks sort of like this, is shaped in this fashion, it has a long bill, a long neck, and kind of a low body with webbed feet, you're probably gonna be able to figure out pretty quickly that it's a species of duck. Whereas if you have a bird that's a little bit more round in head and body and is quite small, maybe you could fit on your hand, that could be something that we would call our backyard feeder birds, like a chickadee or a sparrow. So when you're looking at a bird, the first thing you wanna say is how big is this bird and what is its general shape? Because you probably know a lot more than you really give yourself credit for. You know what the shape of a duck looks like. You know what the shape of a sparrow looks like. You probably also know what this shape is. And this is part of an animal's shape, but also its behavior. If you see a bird climbing up and down a tree, and it's got this nice long body with a really long beak, you're probably gonna guess maybe that's a woodpecker, right? So we're gonna take a look at size and shape. We're gonna take a look at their behavior. Are they on the ground? Are they in the sky? Are they on the trees? Are they going up and down the branches? You can also look at their colors and patterns. So one way to kind of test yourself is to take a picture of a bird and look at it very quickly and try to memorize as many things about its shapes and its colors and its patterns as possible. So I'm gonna show you guys a bird. I'm gonna hold it up for 10 seconds and then I'm gonna put it back down. And I want you guys to think what colors, what shapes, what patterns did I notice on this bird? All right, so here we go. We're going to meet our very awesome, not live bird, but assistant today. This one right here. Take a look, colors, patterns, shapes. All right. So even in that quick amount of time, you probably can note a few different things. What colors did you notice? Did it have stripes or spots? Was it very large or very small? These are things that are gonna come in handy when you're outside watching for birds because birds unfortunately don't always sit for very long periods of time. We'll see them today at the feeder probably moving in and out really quickly. So hopefully in that quick 10 seconds, you might have observed that this is a pretty large bird and it's owl shaped. It has a very rounded head and a long body. Maybe you noticed that it had really big eyes that were all black. 
You might have even noticed that it was kind of gray and white in color with some stripes or bars. So all of that information, even if you don't know what this species is, can help you figure it out. And once you have that information, you can use a handy dandy guidebook to help you. You don't have to be an expert to be able to look through a guidebook and match up pictures. There's also really great bird watching uh, quick resources that you can find online. This one is again from Cornell. This is your feeder birds. So it's going to have all different common birds for your area. So this is going to be for the Northeast. This is typically what you might see in our neighborhoods in the winter. And it's got two different sides. It has the males and the females. So if you memorize the size, the shape, any colors and patterns you saw, you can easily get one of these online. You don't even have to have a fancy guidebook and you can compare. And most of the time, you're not gonna be seeing anything rare or crazy. Someone else probably is going to see something in the area similar to you, so it'll be easy to track down what type of bird that was. So once you've identified your books, or your birds, um, when it comes to the Great Backyard Bird Count, all you have to do is write down how many of those birds you saw. And then you're going to submit them on birdcount.org or through this really cool app called eBird. So there are so many different ways you can submit your data um, from your home or your school, or if you come and join us here at the zoo, we'll do that for you. But it's really, really easy. You just go outside, you count birds for 15 minutes, and you submit your data online. So we're gonna pop our heads outside. There was some really noisy bird activity going on, and we're gonna see if anybody's hanging out at our feeders. And then we're gonna come back in and talk about how to attract different birds to your neighborhood if you wanna participate in this count, or if you just wanna kinda of hang out with some cool backyard birds. So let's go outside. We're gonna see if anybody is hanging out at our feeders. All right, so it's a little quiet right now, but we'll wait a few moments. We do have a nice big fat squirrel, of course, hanging out at our bird feeder. And this is not super uncommon. Uh, if anyone does have bird feeders at home, you've probably attracted a squirrel or two to your area. Now, typically here at the zoo, we have a couple different bird feeder areas. This is our bird feeder area right outside of our discovery center. And we have it set up with three different types of feeders. So one of those feeders is gonna have some shelled nuts in it, one's gonna have, and two are gonna have seed. And you can almost kind of see underneath that tree, the cedar tree, there are some birds hopping around. So hopefully they'll pop out here in a moment. The best time to watch for birds is going to be in the morning. They're the most active, especially if you have some weather coming through. Now we've had a lot of snow lately, um, and we're gonna have more snow on our way. So this is actually a really great time to count and watch for birds um, because they need to fill up, they need to, to find as much seed and food as possible and stock up on that food before the storm comes in. So that's when you're active, you're most likely gonna see birds active at your feeders. It's gonna be early morning when they are um, looking for that good, good stuff. So we have two different areas. We have this one set up here, and then on the other side of our building, we have a bird feeder area as well, uh, which we can walk over and take a look at, and maybe we'll see some more birds at that one. So we do try to put out seed throughout the winter season. We're gonna walk along this way, see if anybody else wants to show up. Now we try to put our bird feeders in areas where there are also protective spaces. So we have bird feeders set up, not out in the middle of the open, but actually basically where all the trees and brush are so that we can provide safe spaces for the birds. That's kind of the best way to encourage them to come to your feeder area. So over here, we also have um, some different feeders set up kind of in our open space between some exhibit areas. We have some different Again, some different types of feeders. We have nuts, we have seeds, and we have some suet feeders as well. And of course, when we go live, we have all of our bird friends hiding today, uh, which is, you know, we can't encourage nature to do what nature doesn't want to do. So here we are. Um, but you can see that we have lots of trees, lots of branches that they can hide and move in and out of. And this is really important. Birds don't want to expose themselves for too long if they don't have to. Now, the really interesting thing is that we've actually had uh, a little hawk friend hanging out the last 
few um, weeks, who is a bird eater. So it's even more important for us to create space where these birds can hide. Um, otherwise, you may not see them out very often because they definitely are a little bit more at risk. So we're gonna just take a moment to listen because there is some bird activity. Uh, we're just not seeing them, we're hearing them right now. So hopefully you guys can hear that too. They're actually up in this tree behind me. So we'll kind of turn a little bit. And if you take a listen, you might hear that chickadee dee dee, chickadee dee dee. That is one of our most common winter birds, the chickadee very distinct call. So when you're bird watching, you can try to identify their calls as well. Now with the bird count, the backyard bird count, it's best to record who you actually see because sometimes it's hard to make a guess on, on how many you're hearing versus how many you're seeing. But it is fun to try to identify them by call too. So we'll casually walk back up here. Maybe they'll be out for us to see. All right, so those ones hopping around in the trees going chickadee dee dee, those again are black capped chickadees. A moment ago, we had a little gray friend with a crest that's called the tufted titmouse. And of course, our lovely fat gray squirrel <laughs> right there who's munching. Ah, oh, there's one of our little chickadee friends. You can hear a blue jay in the background as well. And it looks like we have some little house sparrows hanging around as well too. So you can get a wide variety of, of birds in your backyard. We'll head back over to our classroom to learn how to attract these different guys to different areas. Um, Oh, there goes our blue jay friend. If we walk over this way, we might be able to see him a little better. So that noisy bird, that is our, our blue jay. And we have a couple different types of food set up. <laughs> He's coming down to grab a peanut. And you can see he came down very, very quickly and then he immediately went back up into that tree. Not wasting any time hanging out on the ground because that's where he's gonna be the most vulnerable. So again, it's really important to try to set up your bird feeders in an area that provides your birds some safe spaces. So we'll walk back towards the classroom. Maybe some more birds will pop down. winter morning ambiance for you guys with the birds singing. There we go. All right, guys. So we're going to pop back inside and learn how to attract these birds to your backyard. So hopefully maybe towards the end, there'll be some more bird friends hanging out. So you guys can come back inside and we'll prep some bird food. All right, so at those feeders, we had a couple different varieties of food. So depending on what type of birds you wanna to encourage to visit you, you can try different mixes. Um, right here we have, and if we wanna come get a nice close look, we have a mixture, your general bird feeder mix. So this actually includes sunflower seeds, it has some millet and cracked corn, and then some of these other little brown seeds. This is gonna attract the most variety. So this will include things um, like your sparrows, your cardinals, juncos, and doves. Uh, the one thing that, that is a little bit of a downside to this type of bird food is that it does attract so many different types of birds, including non-native ones. So house sparrows and starlings will also come and eat this. So if you're trying to stick with just the native birds, um, this mix might not be the best choice, but it is a great option for your general bird feeders. And then here we have these tiny, tiny, tiny little black seeds. These are called Niger or thistle. 
And this is gonna attract some of your specialty sparrows. One of my favorites is the goldfinch. Um, I'm sorry, it's gonna attract your specialty finches and sparrows, and then the goldfinch really enjoys this. And so they are a bright yellow and black bird that's really beautiful to see. And they have tiny, tiny little beaks, so they need tiny, tiny little seeds. And then we have a peanut mixture here. So you have your shelled right here, and then uh, your in-shell stuff here. So these provide different options for your jays, your crows, and things like woodpeckers. And different, different types of feeders can either hold the fully shelled ones or the ones that are outside of their shell. It kind of depends on the size of the bars in between, but you can do both options. These get a little bit more expensive than your general bird seed, but it is better for those birds like nut hatches and um, even, like I said, your, your uh, woodpeckers that have the really long beak. And then you can also do suet. So suet is usually a mixture of some kind of high protein, high fat material that is going to hold together some extra special ingredients like different seeds and fruits and stuff like that. We're actually gonna make our own little suet feeder today. So you are welcome, of course, to purchase these different items, your usual feed stores, um, even like your big box stores and, and local um, hardware stores are gonna have bird seed options. But if you would like to do something at home, especially on these cold snowy days coming up, you can make your own little bird feeders. All you really need is some kind of seed mix. And then we like to use Crisco, but you can also use any kind of peanut butter or nut butter. We typically go with Crisco here at the zoo just because we do a lot of camps and we try to avoid any kind of nut butters, but both of these options are good for birds. It provides that high fat, high protein stuff. So the first type of bird feeder you can make is just a general toilet paper tube um, recycled bird feeder. So I have a TP tube here. You could use a longer paper towel tube, whatever you're interested in. You need a little hole punch or some way to make a hole on each side and that's just for your string. So this is a very, very, very simplistic method that helps you to reuse and recycle some materials you might have lying around your house. And it's safe for birds as well. So you kind of just string yourself through there, tie a little knot, and this will hang on a tree, on a fence post, wherever you would like to put it. And then comes the really fun part. Now, disclaimer, this can get a little bit messy, so I definitely recommend um, having gloves on hand or having a place to wash your hands immediately after because uh, Crisco and nut butters and stuff can get out of hand very quickly, especially if you have little friends at home that are helping with this. But you're simply gonna take your Crisco or your nut butter and you're going to smooth it on to your tube. You can put as little or as much as you want. Obviously, the more you put on there, the more that the seed is going to stick and the happier your little bird friends will be because they will also eat this material. So it's not just to keep the seed sticking on there, it's also to provide nice high fat, high protein for those birds because the winter gets very cold and they burn a lot of calories. So once you have it pretty well covered, you're gonna roll it in your seeds. You can also kind of scoop and smush it on there. Make sure it's nice and covered. And you can do any kind of seeds you want. Obviously the smaller seeds stick a little bit better, so I would avoid your peanuts and your shelled peanuts and things like that. There you go. And now it's ready to put outside. Very simple, very easy, nice and recycled. Just make sure um, that you are using material that can break down or that you recollect after you're done. So this yarn, we wouldn't wanna leave that out for too long. We wanna go and collect that once the birds have eaten all the seeds. The second method you can do is actually a little bit more messy. So if you're looking for more of a challenge, you can create your own suet, as I said. So you're gonna need some seeds and you're gonna need that Crisco or nut butter. And then you can take any shaped cookie cutter. I would recommend something that's pretty wide though, because we want it to stay nice and, and all together. And you're going to basically mix together your Crisco and I'm gonna put gloves on just so that I'm not completely covered in it. You're gonna mix together your Crisco or your nut butter and your seeds to make kind of like a weird Play-Doh-y uh, mixture. So you want it nice and mixed together. This is a full hand operation here and very messy, which makes it really fun. So you're gonna to try to kind of mash that all together, really get it mixed in like that. And then you'll take it, and it's good to have your cookie cutter on like a, 
paper plate or a plate that something that you can remove later and you're going to smash it into the shape so you might need to make a lot of this mixture to get it all the way filled and it's good to make it nice and thick so I'm gonna smash that in there and then I would probably do like another layer but before I do the other layer, I'm actually gonna take my string and I'm gonna kind of stick it through the middle there so it's nice and strong. We're gonna make another little bit of batch here. All right. And then once you're done filling your whole mixture, get some more seed into your cookie cutter you are going to put it in the freezer. So you wanna smash that all in there. Make sure you cover your string. And you could even go a little bit thicker if you wanted to. All right, and then that is ready to go into the freezer. And you wanna leave it for about a day, maybe a little bit longer. You can kinda of test it to see. And then once it's ready, you would remove the cookie cutter and you would remove the plate and you'll have kind of a nice solidified suet, uh, suet flake that is in whatever shape you wanted to make it. So I did a heart here, you could do, or sorry, a star here. You could do a heart for Valentine's Day. You could get really crazy if you have all different kinds of cookie cutter shapes. Uh, again, you wanna kind of use a really wide shape though, just so things don't fall off and then you can hang it out upside, outside. Now do keep in mind that if the weather gets kind of warm, you may end up with some melting suet, but you know, the animals will still eat it nonetheless. So on these cold, cold days, this is a really fun activity to help those birds in your backyard. So we can actually pop outside again if we have any questions today on our birds or our bird feeders or our bird count. I heard some more bird activity, so we'll see if anybody else is hanging out there as we take any questions that you might have and then we'll sign off for the day. So let's see if our friends are hanging out um, at the bird feeder and we'll go hang up our little bird feeder as well. All right, we've got a few little friends hanging out now. We'll take a look here. It looks like we've got some little sparrows. Looks like house sparrows and maybe some white-throated throated sparrows. Our squirrel friend is back, of course. And we've got another chickadee hanging out. And then we've got some geese flying overhead as well, which is pretty cool. So again, when you do the bird count, you're gonna count anything that you see, whether it's at the feeder or just in your general area. That often includes here at the zoo, our black vulture friends, <laughs> if you've come to visit us. All right, I'm gonna walk over there and hang up our feeder and then we'll sign off for the day. Well, thank you for joining me for our great backyard bird count. Remember, if you're interested in getting involved and you're not really comfortable doing it on your own, we are hosting the backyard bird count on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of this week. Our Blue Jay decided that now's the time to interrupt. <laughs> so you're welcome to sign up online. Registration can be found at our Eco Family Programs link in the Education Programs on our website, elmwoodparkzoo.org. Or if you're interested, again, in getting involved in the Great Backyard Bird Count on your own, you can check out birdcount.org for more information. I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day, and we will see you on Thursday.